would like it to be, and also within the time frame that mm -hmm. is um, uh, re uh, required, unless you really know how to do it better, better and are joining up. Now, what does this mean in practice? It means that we cannot look at policies anymore in isolation. We have to think about biodiversity as reinforcing um, climate change. The biodiversity strategy was very um, ambitious uh, uh, and enforceable targets needs to be in place. Um, joined up also means that we need to have another look at how we are actually um, uh, rolling out our energy policies and what sort of decisions we're making in terms of um, biomass, for instance, uh, in terms of um, what systems we're going to put in place for rolling back, um, scaling back the degradation of ecosystems. And I mean here, for instance, um, how far we are going to go for real uh, nature-based solutions. I'm talking about even after the uh, coronavirus um, uh, um, goes away and we fight it back, I hope that we are going to fight it back successfully, I'm sure we will. Uh, what sort of stimulus packages are we going to be seeing? Are we going to see more of a, um, uh, of a, of a stimulus pack a package which is based on um, a consistency with the Green Deal um, objective, for instance? Are we going to have more of uh, fiscal rules or um, fiscal reforms that will actually um, uh, give more stimulus to public investment in a decarbonization of the economy. This is what I mean by joining up, and I think um, more so when I would say on the front line is how far are we going to be aligning our environmental objectives with our health policy? Okay, and Joanna. How far yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt you. So all of this sounds great, okay? And you're posing a lot of questions. What I want to know from you is, what does it feel like inside? Is it coming in together? Are people working together where you'd like them to work? Because one of the one of the issues around the response to this virus crisis is that we've seen a woeful lack of collaboration. We've not seen evidence of di uh, director generals working collaboratively horizontally, at least not from the outside. And you know yourself, the commission's not well versed in working in that fashion which is co collaborative, breaking down silos, which is required in an emergency. So at this first hurdle of this new mandate, we've not been given a lot of confidence to see that actually we can tackle this in the way that you're describing. If you can, in this context, share with us, there's a lot of questions you're posing, but what does it feel like inside and do you have confidence we're going to move forward in the way that we need to? I actually have a lot of confidence. Um, first of all, I think the Green Deal itself has been itself triggering this new method of working. And I have seen it with my own eyes. I have been part of the Commission for the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that only in the last year or even in the preparation towards the Green Deal have I seen a real co-creation effort being translated into an actual methodology of working which is different to what I had witnessed before. And this means not simply having you know, one DG in the lead and the rest just commenting or perhaps adding you know, a few ideas here and there, but really a co-creation uh, co exercise in real time. And I think this is uh, laying the foundations for what, of course, needs to be an even upping of the game, I would say, one brought on by this crisis uh, that we've seen, and secondly, I think the aftermath of that. And I think what we, we would need to do more is definitely for, first of all, Europe to lead by example in visibly showing a collaborative way of, of externalizing it, uh, its collaborative way of working. And I think I agree with you, I tend to agree with you, but I think we were rather, first of all, hesitant in actually being collaborative, in, in, in reacting to the corona crisis. But I think um, after we have actually internalize that this is going to hit hard the heart of Europe and the member states. I think Europe took on the coordinating role, but I think it needs to also up its game, up its game of the aftermath of Corona. And that means actually showing, externalizing, <coughs> I would say, a global solidarity plan that needs to be seen to be um, put in act, put, put forward with all the stakeholders on board. And I think this is the other part that also needs to be a bit more visible and I think very much more convincing in terms of working methodology.
thank you. Thank you very much for that. I'm sure that those of you who are watching, listening, uh, will have, have questions, questions and I will bring you in, I promise. Those of you who are on live stream, just remember you can use Slido to pose your questions and we will make sure we pull those together and we're able to pose those questions. Joanna, thank you very much. I'm going to move to Radhika. Radhika, you're from, you're from the, uh, you're the director of the Global Ecosystem uh, Management Program at the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And my, I suppose my question to you is really, how realistic is to think that nature-based solutions are the panacea? Are they, you know, are they the answer to climate change? What are the unintended consequences or the issues that we need to be thinking about? Radhika, over to you. Sure, thank you, Dharmendra. Firstly, let me congratulate your team for so quickly turning this into this amazing virtual panel. It was supposed to be a face-to-face -face event, but it's just been an impressive amount thank of you. work done by you guys to, to bring us all together and, and keep this going. So I'm very happy to join. Um, so for, for IUCN, we've been in the business of protecting biodiversity for the last 71 years. And yet we're seeing, um, we're seeing um, high levels of um, extinction and uh, ecosystem degradation. And this whole concept of nature-based solutions has come about from work dating back to 80s and 90s of looking at how is it that we can uh, go beyond safeguarding nature to harnessing the services and the functions of ecosystems to support the needs of society, of human well-being. Um, and doing that not necessarily means destroying biodiversity or at the expense of biodiversity, but how do you find ways to actually provide this multiple benefits where we're not degrading nature for our future generations, but we're also looking at it as our developmental strategy, as our solution for water, for energy, for food security. So for IUCN, it's, it's been um, about 30 years of work put into this, where we've tested uh, workable models. And this is an overarching umbrella concept that brings together the, the concepts such as natural capital, natural infrastructure, ecosystem-based adaptation, uh, green infrastructure. And it's trying to show nature as a solution rather than something that you have to safeguard or put tape around, which will actually impede development. But then in our definition, the definition IUCN uses, there's three differentiations. One is there'll always be solutions that are nature derived. So solar energy or wind energy, for example, one uh, where it's nature inspired by mimicry. But nature-based solutions is, for example, looking at how do you use ecological systems as infrastructure, as a response for reducing disaster risk. So that very essence of using nature-based solutions is about multiple benefits and it's about protecting biodiversity, but with a different strategy. So any nature-based solution that is destroying biodiversity or has an overall negative impact on biodiversity cannot be classed as nature-based solution. And, and that's the definition okay. IUCN has been working with and promoting. And um, to say it's, it's the only solution, uh, we, we don't say it's the only solution. We live in reality in a very built environment. So how do we complement nature as a solution where there's already heavy infrastructure, engineered solutions, technological solutions? And interestingly for Europe, uh, perhaps without realizing, Europe's been leading this area of work. Our pioneering work on nature-based solutions came out of our Brussels office. You, many of you know that we have a regional Europe office in Brussels with uh, the leadership of Luc Bass, mm -hmm. who's our regional director. And the work on nature-based solutions started in the, Europe, the, the Brussels office with urban landscapes. So we have tested models, we have mechanisms okay. that can show that nature-based solutions can not only be a new solution, but a very complementary solution to the world we already exist in. Okay. And in bringing nature-based solutions to the table, you are very much aligning your biodiversity aspirations with trying to solve the problems that climate change is posing. Sorry, uh, No, but sure. Radhika, thank you for that. But can you just, just a couple of challenges. But uh, we know that by the end of this century, but even now we're seeing huge urbanization. 95% of the world's population will be in cities by the end of this century. We know that for sure, when we think about the trajectory of development. So what's your advice to governments in that context? What's, what's the policy challenges that they 
they should be taking account of if you're going to make biodiversity work, given that wider context, and also digital. So it, I mean, just so your thoughts on that would be really helpful. Because you've got a commission here, you've got other people listening to you, and then people say, yes, biodiversity solution, but actually, what's the bridging that you need to be thinking about in terms of the policy? So, um, so there, every time we present nature-based solutions, it can be overwhelming because it is complex. It is about moving from site-based approaches and site-based thinking to systems-based thinking. Mm -hmm. So if we are thinking about cities, well, let's redefine what we mean by cities. Mm -hmm. It's not simply about putting in a green park here or a nice uh, cooling stream that flows through, which is beautiful for aesthetics. It's about looking at systems, and that is the ecological system, that is the societal system, that and the market systems that surround us as people living in these spaces, whether it is cities or rural areas. So that means thinking beyond the jurisdictions we confine ourselves to, whether it's subnational, uh, local, or national in the case of EU, the different member states and how they can work together, very much going back to the, the previous discussion of how do we come okay. together to look at it at a system level. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's what we need to push for if nature-based solutions are to become um, a concrete solution for climate change. Okay, I think what we have to do, and perhaps some of our participants may have questions around this, is that what does that actually mean in practice? You're a mayor of a town, of a city, you're an urban planner, what does that whole systems approach really mean? But let me bring some of our, our people in uh, from the, either the, the, the Zoom uh, and uh, uh, others who may want to ask a question. Are there any questions out there? Hands up. You just have to kind of raise your hand. Okay, you're fairly quiet at the moment. You're consuming this information. That's not a problem at all. Thank you very much. Okay, but don't hesitate. Don't forget, this is a part. This is also about you uh, having the opportunity to ask the questions that you need to ask. So let me move on then. I'm going to move on to um, uh, an area that's not necessarily well regarded in this space. Uh, and ironically, it's space. Uh, we have the European Space Agency here. We have one of the directors, Joseph. Joseph. What does Earth observation have to offer us on this agenda? Because obviously um, we know that Earth observation, the satellite capacity, Copernicus and others in Europe, is the jewel, of the jewel in the crown of the EU. We know that as it moves forward, we need further investment in it, but it provides a really sharp um, sense of a radar and real-time data. Tell us from your perspective, what does it have to offer and what do we need to think about as we move forward on this particular journey? Indeed. It's pretty grim. Um, so I'm very happy that I can uh, join you uh, remotely. Uh, so what is the power of Earth observation? Uh, I think a very valid point, and it may not come to everyone's mind that Earth observation or space is, uh, is uh, of interest or is even useful uh, for biodiversity, nature con conservation, and uh, similar topics. Uh, but in fact, it is. Um, and uh, in order to highlight the power of, of Earth observation, I, um, I have with me or I can connect to uh, two small videos just to highlight a little bit uh, since we are talking all about coronavirus and the infections of what satellites are doing on a daily basis uh, and to show you two examples uh, which, uh, which I have here and which I really would like uh, to share uh, with you. Uh, let me just make sure this works. Share screen. Yes. Uh, okay, what, what is shown here? Can you see the screen? Mm -hmm. It's very good. Yes. Okay, uh, explain to us what that is. Is uh, China, or uh, let's say the area around China, and these are measurements uh, taken from one of our satellites uh, of NO2. Uh, NO2, as, as you know, is produced mostly by traffic and, uh, uh, and uh, industry. Uh, and the more red you see in this uh, picture, the more pollution you have, or the more traffic and industrial activity you have. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting this uh, movie now just to to see the changes, what you see uh, when it comes over the time frame is uh, a gliding average of NO2 concentration uh, of the atmosphere uh, over uh, the period uh, December to uh, mid of March. And 
we see here that the dark red areas are completely disappearing. Wow. Uh, and um, especially in the Wuhan area, which you will see uh, some in the center here, uh, which basically means that all the, uh, all, but a lot of the industrial activities have uh, basically uh, gone down due to the lockdown of uh, uh, the various industries. I can play it once more just to recall uh, these uh, pictures. It is quite stark and remarkable. It, it has to be uh, said. Massive, if not to say shocking, shocking uh, indeed. We saw this picture at the beginning. Uh, we decided not to publish it. Now we have published it, but not at the uh, immediate first days because uh, this may have good impacts on uh, the stock market or, or other uh, indeed. decisions you might, you might imagine. Let me show you now uh, the same for Europe. Um, and what you see here, exactly the same period, again, early January to mid of March, a gliding average. Have a look at the Italian. So we haven't got we haven't got Europe on at the moment. You need to be able to switch the slide. You need to close this and then go on to your next one. There we go. Europe's on. Uh -huh. And you will really see again the very same effects. Uh, and just for, for our viewers, this is basically the same time frame? The same time frame, yes. And again, you see um, this wow. is uh, much lower in, uh, in Central uh, Europe and in, uh, in Italy in particular, which was the first of the countries with the lockdown. Uh, and uh, this is up to the 16th of March. Uh, in fact, I uh, couldn't get hold of the images of today, uh, uh, but uh, we will publish one towards the end of the week, which is uh, more recent, and will show this effect even more drastic. So what I really want to, to highlight is that our satellites are taking the pulse of our planet. We have seen these uh, two examples, I think, quite impressively. Uh, but today's topic is really biodiversity, and uh, there, again, the satellites are measuring all the parameters you need in order to, uh, to measure and to observe how they change at the global level for biodiversity, and these are, as you know very well, uh, changes of land use, uh, changes in the ocean, uh, the, uh, and, and really the, 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 the vegetation and the change of vegetation which we are monitoring there. Uh, we're having projects where we use satellites, for example, for uh, malaria uh, uh, monitoring. Again, malaria, as you all know very well, is connected with certain types of vegetation, certain temperatures, uh, uh, humidity, uh, soil moisture. So there are a number of parameters which are very sensitive to or very favorable to uh, mosquitoes uh, to breed and therefore uh, transmit the malaria. And again, this is something we do on a, on a daily level. So what is this uh, doing? This is um, uh, really uh, images or data taken from Copernicus. Uh, Copernicus is uh, uh, the European program on Earth observation. Uh, we're having, at the moment, seven uh, satellites in orbit. Uh, we are launching uh, the eighth one towards the end of the year. I hope that uh, due to coronavirus uh, limitations, we, we can really go to launch uh, because uh, at the moment you can imagine that industry and all the uh, various players are quite uh, severely hampered. Uh, the plan is to launch in November. Um, and uh, the buildup of, uh, of Copernicus has been an effort where we invested, and this is Europe, uh, where Europe invested over the last 20 years to build up this constellation. It took mm -hmm. 20 years, but today, and I think uh, Europe can be extremely proud, mm -hmm. uh, Europe has the best Earth observation capability from space. Indeed. Uh, this is quite remarkable because normally when you hear space, you would think of NASA or sometimes China, who has recently been landing on the backside of the moon and is building up a, a space station. There, in Earth observation, Europe has the global leadership, and uh, this is uh, it's really fantastic. Uh, we are now going into the next phase of this program, uh, new satellites have been uh, developed. Uh, we have just got a, a funding round uh, within the European Space Agency uh, through a ministerial conference. Uh, I've asked for 1.4 billion uh, for Copernicus co-funding uh, to the EU program. Uh, we have got 1.8 billion, so you see that uh, member states have given us 400 billion more than what I asked for, and this is really a sign that Europe is very committed Good. Uh, in, in this data. That is if they actually agree the MFF in, 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 the, exactly, in the near this future. That's exactly my point. Uh, the next, uh, of course, uh, important step is the co-funding through the MFF. Uh, there is uh, uh, 
about 6 billion uh, today in these uh, documents which are negotiated uh, uh, at uh, EU state, he uh, heads of state level uh, uh, member states. And uh, there uh, we have today uh, these 6 billion foreseen. However, uh, I hope that despite Corona and despite all the measures which of course the economy will now take under, I'm sure there will be huge discussions on how to use this, uh, uh, this funding. But it is required and it is important that uh, uh, this system is built up in support of climate change and in support of biodiversity and many, many other uh, sectors sure. in our dealing. Sure. Just if I can push you, what my understanding is that NASA is probably the biggest user of, of the satellite capacity data, which is obviously free, uh, and they're using more than what we do in Europe. Can you give any examples of what your hopes are of the union making much more use of the data to actually guide policy making? Uh, that's exactly what you say, and this is quite uh, surprising that the number one uh, data which uh, people can retrieve from NASA's website is our European Sentinel data. It is not uh, completely true that uh, NASA is the biggest user. The European users are the bigger ones, mm -hmm. but within NASA and all the data which NASA is, uh, is offering, uh, the uh, European Sentinel data are the number one data that have, have been retrieved from the NASA website, even more than their own NASA satellites, which they also offer on the same platform. Indeed. So, but um, now coming back to, to what you say, I think this is uh, quite important that our data policy is free and open, uh, which means that really everyone can use this data. But what we really need to do, and this is an effort that uh, uh, Europe uh, needs to uh, invest uh, more, is to make sure that European data are offered on European platforms using European algorithms. And this is exactly what uh, Commissioner Breton is uh, proclaiming. And uh, this is something we are working on with the European Commission, with uh, DG Defi, with DG Connect, uh, uh, but also DG Environment as a, as a main user of uh, these data and information uh, to make sure that uh, this uh, is a European solution where European businesses, sure. Europe users benefit uh, uh, large but, amounts. But what you're uh, saying is currently up to this point, you've not seen, there's not been a systematic approach of using the data that you have and that's ve readily available in the policy making process. Are you formally involved in any policy making mechanism that helps making, making sure that data is used in, a, in an effective way? I mean, we are the European Space Agency and as such we are, our job is to develop satellites and provide data and we do this uh, uh, with uh, or in support of European Union, in particular okay. the uh, DFI. Uh, so the the uh, the policy aspects are really the ones that are uh, defined by the EU uh, and the European Commission. And uh, in fact, we are working with them uh, uh, on uh, this uh, program. Copernicus is in fact an EU-led uh, program where the European Space Agency is providing the space uh, solution. That means the satellites, the data, operations of the satellites, and making sure uh, that. Uh, uh, these uh, data are okay. really uh, supporting uh, the European Union policies. Of course, one of the main policies that we are supporting is the EU Green Deal exactly. and the biodiversity agenda, and these are uh, policies that are defined at the EU level. It's a very diplomatic response, Joseph, and I understand why you say that what you have, but it occurs to me, it occurs to us as Friends of Europe, is that when you think about the climate crisis, but also the current crisis, you almost need a kind of a situation room type approach where you use the data that you have together with those who are making decisions real time to really guide and navigate how we come out of this current crisis, but also the climate crisis. But let's hope that that's what will happen uh, and brings you in not just being an observation capacity, but bringing in, your, bringing in what you have to offer in real time decision making, which is actually what's required right now is agile decision making that's, that's very, very clear um, and timely to be able to address what we're, what we're witnessing at the moment, but also the climate change crisis that we're witnessing too. Okay. Amanda, if, I, if you allow me just one quick uh, point on this, and I think this is exactly what, uh, what we should aim at. And there's one project we call it Digital Twin Earth, where we want to create exactly. a digital twin of our planet to really simulate uh, the state of our environment, uh, but also help decision makers uh, to use this information, play different scenarios, and therefore be in a much better position to make good decisions uh, for their country, for their region, for their organization, uh, which is uh, quite an effort. Uh, but we are working on a concept to build up this digital twin earth.
Excellent. I know, and that sounds like a, a brilliant initiative, and I hope that, that can, again, be used effectively as a, as a pathfinder for the rest of the world in terms of Europe making more of that capacity. Colleagues, those of you who are on screen and also live stream, please do. Uh, those of you who are on Zoom, raise your hand virtually if you have a question. Uh, that would be really helpful to me so that I can understand who's out there that wants to ask a question. I believe we have a question from Jerome. Jerome, are you there? No? I am. Ah, Jerome. Again, say who you are and what your question is, please. Okay, Jérôme Bequignon, the European Space Agency. It's a question to the panel. So we are well aware of the uh, objectives in terms of reducing uh, greenhouse gases emissions. So are there specific similar targets for what, when it comes to biodiversity? Joanna, can I ask you to address that question directly? Thank you so much for that. I would say yes, there will be targets because this is exactly the next step of taking, of showing that we are not only wanting to be in the lead, but also leading by example. Um, of course, um, we are not at the stage yet to be able to divulge the contents of the biodiversity strategy because this is uh, about to be adopted uh, hopefully very soon. But I can tell you that uh, the biodiversity strategy has been uh, a test in itself of how far we have been able to join up not only the policies um, that uh, together um, need to make the impact that we need in order to restore, to preserve, and also to conserve the ecosystems that have been, uh, that have been uh, degrading, but also in terms of what was being just said now, and also in your question, regarding how far do we involve um, like the, state, the space agency like our uh, environmental agency and all the data and um, not only from european bodies but also from international bodies like who uh, etc mm. into a policy making we are all the time drawing on not only the evidence but also the recommendations that these bodies give us and update us with all the time we are in a in a, in a i would say in a unique position to be you know um, very much um at the, the in a very collaborative um, relationship over time with uh, with these bodies and not only are we collaborating but also we are together shaping what we believe to be you know the best example to give and that means taking it seriously and uh, not only at european level but also at the level of the stakeholders and this means governments um, in the national and regional capacity excellent thank you very much um, Radhika, do you want to comment on this at all? Uh, sure, I can. So, so that's the whole uh, process of um, uh, the 2020 target setting and, and uh, the last decade has also showed us that we need to move beyond looking at uh, uh, species, uh, populations, habitat-based ta targets to perhaps targets that are more oriented towards behavioral change as well. So this transition phase of using these three pillars of protection or conservation, restoration and sustainable use. And what does that look like in terms of moving towards um, uh, towards doing the right thing in, in turning this, this around for biodiversity? So uh, we've been very much involved with the CBD processes in helping set those targets and also very much learning from the last decade of many of these targets have not where they haven't been met. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will come to others, and those of you, as I said, remind you, put your hand up virtually or you know, just wave uh, if you have a question to ask, and I'll bring you in. Um, we have someone who's obviously the Radhika you referred to, someone one of the pioneer in Brussels, Luke Bass. Luke, you have a question. Where are you, yes. Luke? Um, well, I'm asking the question because I see that Constance is also on the call. Indeed, but can I ask you to just introduce yourself before you do ask oh, the I'm question? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Luke Buss and I'm the European Regional Director for IOCN in Brussels. Welcome. Um, thanks for, by the way, organizing this so so um, professionally because it looks really great when I see you, Dorindra, with all the screens <laughs> behind you. Thank you. It looks quite impressive. Good, thank um, you. Good to hear. Yeah, so the question, I'm not asking Radhika because I can ask her questions all the time, so I'm not asking her, but I'm asking Joanna, and I think uh, Constance may want to come in. Because it's about how do we go from all these nice pilots into scaling up 
uh, action on nature and more specifically investment in nature-based solutions. I think that's the real uh, big challenge um, in Europe. And of course, we have an opportunity to link it to the climate change agenda, which is one way to, to try to get nature into the equation. But um, I would like to see what, what Johanna's views are on, on how we can move the needle a bit from marginal action to some big action. If, if I, before I do pose that question, Luke, given your experience, you've been here for a long time and you've seen that institution, that institution between the EU move sometimes incredibly slowly, uh, full of inertia, and people have, have often and, and, and very consistently said the bureaucracy just does not move. There's an inertia there. Given your experience and where we are living through right now, do you have confidence at this stage, given what we've seen through the Green Deal, that we're moving to a, that we've turned a corner? Just respond to that first before I bring others in, from your perspective. No, I, I really want to look at the glass half full here because um, this is a huge opportunity, the Green Deal. We, we know that the discussions are not easy uh, from, from everything, everything that we pick up. Okay. Um, but at least there is the intention and the willingness to go beyond, way beyond this as usual. So I hope that we will continue to do this and that, unfortunately, but maybe on the fortunate side, that this crisis may actually show that big things are possible in a positive way. Um, not, so of course we have to solve the urgency here first, but hopefully we draw some really good lessons from that for the future and so it can in fact strengthen the Green Deal mm -hmm. instead of what could also be happening is that we going to use the bailouts and the, and the support mechanisms just for some more business as usual. So it should be an additional opportunity. So yes, I try to be positive about it, but that it moves <laughs> slow, yeah. That is something we have to recognize. Okay. okay. All right. So, so Joanna, Joanna, can I bring you in? Sorry, this, this is kind of in your ballpark. Of course. Um, um, we, we never, I never said that this is going to be an easy path, uh, but it is a necessary path. And, and I think um, in order to answer your question about uh, scaling up, um, well, uh, I agree that a lot of has been, uh, a lot has been done already, and you know certain traps have been set, but I agree they have been piecemeal. And I think now we need to deploy a much broader agenda. And this is why I think the interrelation of policies, but not only between climate, energy and biodiversity, but also with uh, trade and uh, taxation, for instance. I think this is how we scale up. And I think this is where the collaborative effort that I was describing before and the co-creation needs to be seen to be done more seriously as well. But we also need to, in order to reverse this biodiversity loss and avoid even more um, dangerous climate change um, uh, impacts, by the way, one of which is the, the spreading, the exas exacerbation of spreading of infectious diseases, by mm. the way, mm -hmm. I think um, we need to have much more joined up um, and transformative changes across the, the economic and financial systems. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, we need to have planning, development and investment decisions uh, gearing towards uh, the driving of nature uh, restoration. Um, and I think we need to make much more the case that the protection and restoration of nature as, uh, is part of climate change mitigation and change, uh, which makes economic sense. So I think we need to bring out much more the link there um, for those who are not yet convinced, perhaps, uh, that uh, this is the way forward and this therefore should be part of the rebooting of the economy after the coronavirus right. mm -hmm. um, 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 uh, challenge. I would say, linked to what um, uh, the person making the question uh, said, I, I would like to refer to what I said earlier, um, that I think that uh, we need to be Europe in the driving seat. does not only mean that it leads by example, I mean, it also... Uh, leads in the Kunming um, opportunity we have in October. Hopefully, this 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 will still happen. But it's also about um, linking the big bailouts and the big stimulus packages and the big um, economic pack packages that will be done uh, to be linked up with um, uh, projects that satisfy uh, the Green Deal parameters, okay. including a... biodiversity, including including uh, limiting um, health crisis in the future by linking up much more the, the climate change and the biodiversity loss tandem. And in other yeah. words, mm. I would say 
Europe needs to have a much bigger profile going forward in um, securing um, uh, the European identity um, as part okay. of our defense project under biosecurity of pandemics. And I, um, by defense here, I mean the people feeling secure, European sure, citizens, sure. world citizens be, uh, being more secure. Okay, great. And you make a really good point because the, the lessons, lessons that we've learned from the last financial crisis are about how do you then future proof? And I think you're making that point, which is very, very important, is that how do we make sure that the bailouts have some red lines, green lines associated with them, if you like, as we move forward. I, on that point, before I bring in Constance, I want to bring in Vila, um, who uh, is joining us, member of the European Parliament. Vila, my question to you is, does the pandemic, I mean, does the virus crisis blow, blow out any action on climate change as we know it right now? Well, hi, good evening to you all. It's been Welcome. interesting to listen to this discussion. And I think uh, if you look at the, the situation of, of humanity, historically speaking, uh, pandemics have happened and the risk of pandemics have increased when humanity has more or less overstepped its, its sustainability borders. And, and in many ways, uh, the conditions that you have in China with the, with the animal markets, that you have wild animals and, and, and uh, uh, and uh, domesticated animals uh, dead and alive uh, inter uh, acting closely in, in the small um, areas with, with, with humans that is uh, surrounding where risk of pandemics increases and obviously also the loss of biodiversity and, and uh, the uh, weakening of ecosystems uh, is also a cause of, of, of risk of, of increasing uh, uh, risks of uh, different kinds of, of pandemics and, and epidemics. So there is a, a quite a straight link that if we do uh, a smart recovery from, from this uh, very difficult situation addressing uh, coronavirus, we should look at how we can uh, create our economy into a more sustainable uh, uh, system in the long term where we address climate change uh, and actually in the short term also create the jobs by investing in climate action, but also that we uh, have a, a natural link between biodiversity and, and climate action uh, precisely to understand that the way we use natural resources has been totally unsustainable and, and uh, for example, mm. uh, overuse of pesticides and antibiotics in, in uh, food production also has a, an increased risk to, to create bacterial resistance and, and create further problems with, with, with pandemics. So, so there is a link to uh, how we can move to sustainability when we address this, this crisis uh, and also avoid a similar crises in the future. And the answer obviously has to be that the Green Deal should be strengthened in these circumstances and, and, uh, and biodiversity should be an integral part of it. And if I may add also mm. to what uh, previous speakers have said, we have the IG targets and, and uh, we've had uh, the global targets of biodiversity protection, but they have previously not been met because uh, there is no legally uh, binding nature in them and, and there is no in, uh, implementation which has been strong enough. So the European Parliament, I was the Greens uh, co-rapporteur on, on the uh, uh, European Parliament resolution on the uh, Kunming meeting and biodiversity that, that we push for a 30 percent uh, protected areas target both marine and terrestrial and there is a big push for this, this globally there is a big movement for pushing, pushing especially for the marine protection in order to protect uh, fish stocks and, and, and marine life globally and, and these are also very much affected by climate change so I think there's an obvious link to not moving into a world that, where climate um, um, the, the bombing of, of climate creates uh, conditions where we are moving into a structural famine, more or less, because if we lose the fish stocks, if we uh, lose uh, a lot of the fertile land due to uh, sure. uh, uh, sure. aridity, then, then we create a structural famine. So, so we have to address these, these, uh, these issues both but, within Europe. But, but if I, yeah, absolutely. If I, if I may, lots of reports mm -hmm. have been saying what you're, you're saying. saying. We've, We've had, had yeah. countless yeah. reports about the temperature rising, the fact yeah. that we're running yeah. out of time. You, you know, know what you're saying. saying. From, From wait, as, as a parliamentarian, What's your sense of what you will play, what role that the Parliament can play to up the ante and make the Green Deal what it should be in the way that you've just described? Do you have any hope yeah. of that ambition being fulfilled? Well, obviously the Parliament has a position that the majority is pushing for a 55% emission reduction by 2030. And we also have this, this 
these concrete binding, legally binding targets for our, our, our use of biodiversity protection. So the parliament majority is behind these targets. But obviously there is a discussion and there are some forces who have been more or less unwilling to move on the climate and green agenda that, that are now waking up due to the mm. coronavirus crisis and saying that since there is already this one crisis, we can't address the other one. And I think that's that's a really, really bad strategy that that there is an existential crisis to humanity when it comes to, to climate change and biodiversity loss and, 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 and pandemics are also inherently related to that crisis. But if we leave that without being addressing it, then we would just create more problems for ourselves. So I think uh, we should support the Commission and, and uh, Commissioner Timmermans and, and von der Leyen with their, with, they have been stating that they want to keep the Green Deal uh, in the focus also as, uh, as, as Europe comes from the uh, coronavirus crisis. And I think there is a majority in the parliament for that, but it's not automatic. It, there is a political discussion here and we have to be vocal on that. Indeed, uh, perhaps this current context will, I suppose, flatten out the vested interests that have blocked a lot of this. Perhaps agriculture can move in a different, uh, on a different basis as a result, and some of the players that have resisted it may move in a different direction. Let's hope the lessons are being learned from our I current hope situation. There is a positive dynamic there that they actually realise that there is more to gain in circular economy, uh, nutrient recycling, and, and these kind of solutions. And I think big part of biodiversity protection is, as, as was said previously by the IUCN speaker, is also the sustainability of economy and land use and agriculture. But the, the point and that I, you, by the way, what this yeah. is doing there is a very good i mean if we go for uh, concrete uh, targets on on uh, uh, protected areas when it comes to land area it's very good that we have the satellites to to show up for that indeed and i, th I feel yeah, that through the speakers here we actually have a, a roadmap or a crystallization of what the different actors could do to actually work in the direction that we need to and so i hope that you know this conversation will continue post this debate but the point you make i think is really important one about in the public narrative we don't make the connection you're just making about the importance of protecting biodiversity in uh, making sure that we are able to create the kind of preventative mechanisms to not have a further pandemics at a certain extent, to a, to a certain extent. Not all of them, but actually we need to make that causal link, which I don't think the public narrative has actually displayed. I want to, we've got now 10 minutes uh, or 12 minutes left uh, of this particular debate, and I want to bring in some others who've uh, suggested that they want to come in. So, Sophia, Sophia Chrysafulu uh, from Coca-Cola, if I have your name, I, forgive me I have the, if I have your if I pronounced your name wrongly. You, were, you pronounced it perfectly. Thank, Thank you, it's very, very generous of you. <laughs> I'm impressed, and I'm also impressed by, by the Friends of Europe team for connecting us, really. Um, uh, virtually, but also really, uh, really feeling the connection uh, in the room and on the ideas. And thank you all for for, for this passion and the ambition that is really um, it was really very high pre-COVID, but also post-COVID, uh, which uh, which is very important for for the protection of of biodiversity. And it's really important for us and also for our partners that we are working on uh, water replenishment, mm. on uh, water uh, health by improving water management in agriculture, by reforestation. There are really uh, many ways of doing it across, across the globe and of course in, in Europe as well. And um, I would like to ask uh, Ms. Drake, I know many questions have been uh, directed to, to you today, but um, it's about the link that you see between the different ways of carbon offsetting, either by uh, programs, uh, offsetting programs on one hand, but, but also um, more uh, stimulating and encouraging more direct uh, pro uh, programs that have to do with, for example, um, uh, water management, agriculture, so not just only simple, not, not just programs, but also really direct um, stimulation of, of those. And uh, whether you have a line of thinking towards that uh, to stimulate it or not, and how. And also another okay. question that I have is about the um, uh, the, bio the biodiversity. I saw the Green Deal that uh, you said that you need to we need to put more value in restoring our ecosystems. So is the Commission doing some work on valuing the nature and the, the and the and what biodiversity offers us? Okay, thank you. And Sophia, thank you for your contribution. But also, I think from your perspective, what would be interesting, I'm not asking you to respond to this, is that water 
uh, will become both a political, which it is already, an economic and an urgent issue in the next five years, we know. And it's companies like yourself and others, I think, working to collaboratively with government to make sure that 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 resource we take for granted doesn't become a precious resource and that we need to think about. And so we think in long term about some of this. Joanna, before I bring you in, I just want to bring another contributor, if I may, so you get time to kind of think about your, 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 your response. Daisy, Daisy Hessenberger, you wanted to come in. Where are you, Hi. Daisy? Hello. Hello, Daisy. Say who you are. Just introduce yourself. I'm Daisy Hessenberger. I work at the International Union for the Conservation of Nature um, on nature-based solutions. So that, that is my background. And I have a question uh, specifically for Joseph on the, on, the, on the idea of what to do with all this data. So, I mean, ESA is a, <laughs> has a wealth of data and is immensely impressive and something for us all to be proud of. And there is a huge amount of data there. I mean, the UN Data Forum, one of the big challenges is that the data is out there for environmental, for biodiversity. It's more how do we translate that into action and policy? And I think there are good examples out there, but what, what Joseph, do you see is lacking or what is needed to really harness the power of that data, especially when it comes to biodiversity in Europe? Is it you know, linking to the Green Deal stronger or are some, you know, is there not as much investment from the private sector? What are we lacking in Europe to really get that started? And is that really what, what you're saying is that what, why isn't the data on biodiversity affecting the wider policy lens? Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And what what yeah. will it and take? Not just policy, action yeah. on the ground. Yeah, the action on the ground. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. So, jo uh, I'm going to bring uh, Constance in as well. So very briefly, before I, m I finish off with our speakers, Constance, if I can ask you, please introduce yourself and perhaps reflect on your experience. There's a kind of pre-COVID uh, situation where you're you know, generating and uh, escalating towards becoming the first green bank in the world in a particular way. But you know, it'd be useful to understand from you how our current situation is changing things, but also how we kind of make sure that we inoculate ourselves into the future and not just take this crisis as one amongst many, but think long term about green lining some of the kind of um, bailouts um, or the investments we're making. Constance, very difficult question I know also. Please do introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, I'm Constance, I'm with the European Investment Bank and indeed uh, the crisis is also um, uh, basically we have been uh, discussing uh, this uh, very vividly over the last couple of days and also what the EFDIB and all can, uh, can do uh, to, uh, to, to support the economy. That's why we launched this 40 billion SME and mid caps initiative, but also how we can accelerate uh, the, the investment in uh, health, healthcare, uh, hospitals, etc. Uh, in the discussions that we have had, it's also very clear that we're not going to forget our climate credentials uh, as the uh, as FDIB. So um, we yeah, have committed last year that we, you know, would move, you know, financing uh, up to 50% by 2025 for climate and environmental sustainability. So environment is also, you know, very much. Uh, on, uh, on, on our radar screen, uh, Luke. Um, I think one of the challenges uh, that we see is that um, nature-based solutions projects tend to be small. So we've been trying to adapt the financial products that we have uh, for, uh, for that. Uh, but probably there is more that can be done to bring this further under the attention of the players. Uh, what we see is that the uh, uh, zero carbon economy has made a lot of business sectors think through what their decarbonization pathways are. And maybe we have to do a little bit more on, on awareness because we need good projects in, in that area. We have seen that the circular economy platform, for example, has uh, created a lot of sharing of best practices, has pushed you know, uh, also the industry sectors to think through what circular economy elements uh, there are for them. But at the same time, I think if we go to nature, we do, uh, we have launched big projects. I think we're now, we were the first with green bonds in 2018, we were the first, you know, with water bonds. So to really make sure that we have a proper financing for uh, water projects, 
also outside the uh, the uh, EU, uh, and we have launched big initiatives like the Oceans Initiative that we're doing together with KFW and uh, and AFD, where two billion uh, has been made available in order to clean up the rivers uh, across the uh, the globe. Yeah. So, yeah. I suppose the question in everyone's mind will be that given that the bottom's falling out of the economy and uh, we're going to have to see massive quantitative easing, money being flushed in the system. We've seen that. Money is the cheapest to borrow anywhere all over the world at the moment. And it's a case of whether some of these plans will last to the end of the day, if you like, in, 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 the, in the medium to long term, because money just won't be available because you're going to have to ma manage debt in a way that we've never, ever imagined before. Any comment on that from you, Constance? Um, I know it's difficult for you to say. It might be, yes, you're right. <laughs> That's OK. I, I think it is. Um, I think what we are seeing is that there is a serious response, you know, from the, the EU, from the finance ministers to, uh, you know, to, to try to tackle this, uh, this crisis. Uh -huh. And we, uh, there are, you know, commitments and, you know, from the EIB, we can accelerate. And I think we have shown that before. When, uh, you know, the Juncker plan was launched, uh, also a lot of people were not sure, you know, whether it was the issue of finance or the issue of projects. Uh, and uh, we, you know, we have delivered on that. Yeah. I also... Go on, carry on. So I, the yeah, there there is the challenge of the finance and the projects, you know, to to bring you know those uh, properly yeah, properly together. But I'm also quite sure that you know in this you know whole stimulus, we're not going to forget, you know, the the greening of the economy. That, sure, uh, sure. And I was I was being I suppose uh, provocative because I you know nobody knows what's going to happen to the financial uh, system um, as we move forward. It's not like the last crisis, and actually the amount of money that's being required to stimulate our, our world at the moment, and we don't even know when this is going to stop. It's an unfair question I understand, but I think it's something about bearing in mind how will we rethink our financial system because it's going to be ruptured quite significantly as a result of this situation. I want to go back to um, um, our, uh, our friends in the Commission, um, firstly to respond to the question from um, uh, Sophia, and then I want to bring in Joseph on the big data. Hello, hi, here I am again. Well, I mean, it's difficult to answer a question like that, but of course, I think what's sure and what's absolutely clear is that uh, we need to go and have and, and stimulate a rapid shift, a rapid shift mm. towards a sustainable and resilient economy, as well as sustainable and resilient business models. Meaning that um, uh, even if we have the knowledge and the means and the roadmap via the Green Deal, and therefore we have the main pillars on which to build, uh, on the other hand, we need to make that come true, not only by putting into place the biodiversity strategy, the climate law, the farm to fork, but also by having stimuli, which I, I agree, you have to have uh, stimulate investment also via direct programs, via water. For instance, I think we have already a very good example with Horizon Europe, mm. which is for the first time ever um, totally uh, focused on sustainability. Um, but there are also other methods, um, and I think um, different components to the solution need to be there. For instance, the recent greening of the European semester is a very important tool that needs to be mainstreamed much more uh, into making this uh, a reality on the ground. So, in other words, um, we need to uh, now put into practice what studies have been confirming and reconfirming that the more we have nature based, the more that we um, uh, have uh, the protection and restoration of nature as part of the climate change mitigation and adaptation, but also towards this general move, this general trajectory towards this resilience uh, in the economy, newfound resilient and sustainable resilience as well mm, of the okay. economy, uh, 
the more we, um, it will make economic sense. And in order to get to that sort of um, to, to that sort of territory, you also need to have a massive um, deployment, not only of the cash but of the of the right projects in the pipeline already exactly. now, planned to actually you know um, take them on immediately after. Indeed, because sometimes it's not just about the money, it's about what's in the pipeline, but also how you bring it to scale. And Europe's not been that great at bringing things to scale because, because others, others have taken, taken it, like, like China, China or Russia or elsewhere, or, or America, America in particular, particular some, some of the innovations. Well, when, I meant, uh, when, I, when I talk about rebooting the economy, I, I meant about rebooting the economy immediately Indeed. on the pipeline projects that should already be prepared and conceived now. Okay, excellent. Can I bring in um, Joseph, Joseph now, now in in on the, the, the data, data question, question, please? Yeah. Oh, um, thank you, Daisy, uh, for, for raising this point. Uh, um, and your point was really what is needed or what is lacking today to unleash uh, the powers of, uh, of Earth observation for biodiversity in this particular case. Um, and I think it's what, what is missing, um, I think we have done quite well in order to build up a, a good monitoring system uh, from space in Europe. As I mentioned before, Europe has really done a great job to have some global leadership in this. Mm -hmm. But what is really missing is uh, the conversion of these data into information and connecting them with policy makers and policy decisions. Uh, and there I think we really need to, to invest to make sure that we, we do get a good uh, view of our, uh, of our Earth, of our planet, how it changes, and all these changes which we are discussing. And I'm quite happy to see really DG Environment here because uh, the DG of DG Environment, Daniel Kayeka, uh, being a good friend of mine, but also he used to be in charge of, of Copernicus, so he knows extremely well uh, all the powers these, uh, these tools have uh, for environment, climate, uh, biodiversity. And I think this is really required that we have this control panel, or you would call it crisis room these days, mm. uh, where you see the state of our planet, how it changes, where it changes, and where action needs to be taken. Because it is clear who has the information also has uh, control of the situation. And mm. I think uh, uh, this, okay, today we talk all about uh, Corona, uh, but uh, the environment, the state of our planet still is a top priority for everyone uh, post uh, Corona. Uh, and I think this is something where we need to invest uh, to convert this data into information and into information which is used by people uh, sure. and by decision makers in order to make the right decisions. But I think Daisy is asking if for you to be, be give, provide more political response because what she's saying is what's stopping, what is actually stopping politicians and policymakers from making much more use of that data on a practical everyday basis. What we do know, and we know this ev it's ever thus, that governments are very poor at evidence-based policy making you know, because the political cycle and the politics are involved. And perhaps I won't press you on that, but it's, it's, uh, let's hope that this current crisis shifts leadership behaviour and actually wakes, people wake up to ensuring this evidence-based policy making. Time is running out, so I need to bring in, I'm going to bring in one last uh, contribu contributor, and that's Juta. Juta, are you online? Are you there, Juta? Ah, hi. Do introduce yourself. Okay. Um, Welcome. Everyone can hear me? Yes. Oh, fine. Great. Um, I just wanted to bring in one more issue. Intr introduce which... yourself and be brief, please. Yes, sorry. I'm Jutta Paulos, also MEP from the Greens, colleague of Villa. Um, I just wanted to bring in one more issue um, which should be implemented much more in EU politics, in my view. Um, a lot of countries which have passed climate laws already have also introduced an, a scientific body mm. which assesses the forthcomings of or the progress which has been made by different policies and I think it's a pity that we have so much um, knowledge and um, really um, good people working at our agencies too, and they should have more a better role in assessing the policies which are um, passed by the EU and its member states. Thank you for that. And I think no one will disagree with you. One of the recommendations we made from one our, in our Vision for Europe report, which was the new mandate, was, was that Europe, Europe should have its own IPCC, uh, actually, actually having, having its own data set and, and all those scientists and others involved, which guides policy across Europe, which would also include European Space Agency. Well, I think that's all we have time for. Are there any last comments from any of, my, uh, any of the speakers that want to comment on what you've heard so far? No? 
Sure, I, I just ah, have Radhika. one comment. Yes, um, I think it, it's great to hear about you know the the urgency in protecting in restoring nature, but let's not forget that third pillar that we've probably overlooked for a long time, which is sustainable use of it. Mm. People will always depend on nature. There will be uh, um, extractive industries. There would be resource use industry. So how do we actually invest in helping change behavior there? Protection, restoration absolutely is needed, more of it, but the sustainable use aspect is what is where we can really leverage nature-based solution and especially within the Green Deal uh, policy. Yeah. May I also? Please. Yes, I think that's a very good point. And I was just about to say also that I think we can use the uh, satellites also to uh, increase implementation. That is to see that there is no illegal logging and uh, that, that countries are also uh, delivering on their promises. So, so uh, there is a possibility on, on doing a lot more in the sustainable use of resources. I, I think there's a lot of greenwashing still happening. We have to be very clear that we don't double count things, that we don't count things in nature based when they are not that. So that's one area where the biodiversity strategy in Europe has to lead by example. Indeed, thank you for making that point. It's evident that the behaviour change we need is not just simply in terms of our consumption patterns and our production patterns. We also need behaviour change in our leadership decision making behaviour that will actually push, push us in the right direction. I'm going to I'm going to wind up now and to conclude this conversation uh, and this debate, which has been very, very effective and we haven't seemed to have glitches. I shouldn't say that too early in terms of the technology, but I just want to make sure. Are there any last points from um, 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 anybody else that wants to uh, comment on this so far? Joanna, do you want to make a last point or are you, are you done for the moment? You'll have to unmute yourself. I think yourself. I've spoken enough, but my, my, my final point is that um, uh, we, I think, through Corona, have shown that we can, we do have an immense capacity for solidarity. Mm -hmm. This is the first time in human history that society has accepted to do certain things, certain constraints that in the past, until maybe even days ago, we never imagined would be possible in order to protect the vulnerable and the elderly in society. Um, and of course, um, I'm sure that we can live up to the opportunity that's being open for us again, you know, to reboot and to really reinforce um, the global call for solidarity, but also a, a, a very common <clears throat> and global call for action uh, and that everybody takes on responsibilities to carry out you know, their obligations. And I think um, Europe um, has shown the way, I think humanity has shown the way, and I think we can do this, not only for ourselves and to save lives, but also to save our own planet and to give ourselves another chance. Thank you. That's a good point to end on. Thank you, all of you, for your contributions and your questions. Um, as you say, Joanna, it's befitting to con conclude this conversation by saying that the one thing this virus, or a couple of things that this virus has brought to life is our humility, our humbleness, the fact that we're so frail and not fa and, and fallible. And I think what we need to do is think very differently about what we're learning right now, but as we move forward, that suddenly when we're out of this maelstrom, that we don't forget what we meant to each other and what we have to do to actually make sure that we manage these in the future in a way that's meaningful and sustainable. Thank you all. And uh, it's, been, it's been a pleasure to work with all of you. And I hope you found this to be a useful exercise and it's working online. That's good. I can see some nodding faces. If you want to, those of you on Zoom, are you happy with this? Great. I can see hands up. Excellent. Thank you all very much. And those of you who are interested, we have the, our next instalment uh, on Friday morning where we are, I will be in conversation with uh, Vice President Commissioner uh, Vestager. So thank you very much. Take care. Uh, look after yourselves and mind your social distance. See you all. Bye bye.